This has been a, a very challenging month in many, many ways for us. Uh, for me, as I've walked through the month, you know, there's what's taking place that everybody sees, and there's what's taking place that nobody sees. And I began December like you did on December 1st. But in my life, as far back as I can remember, even though I was the oldest, I didn't remember before it happened. Far back as I can remember, my younger brother, birthday was December 1st. And he passed away earlier this year. Um, part of what's rolled with me this month has been seeing pictures of my two grandsons in Charles' home who are about the same distance apart as Tom and I were apart and seeing some of their mischief at a distance. I saw that with Tom up close and personal. One of the memories that has come in this time has been a, a, a fun memory. We would ride forever to get, it seemed like it was forever. You know, when you're the kid in the back seat, if, no matter how far it is, it's too far. And I remember riding across the uh, state of Texas with my parents. They always had the four kids in the back seat. We fought for the windows. And we usually fought for anything. But that's the way it was. When we got to grandparents' house, it was one of those houses that we thought was huge. Now, I've grown up and it's small and I'm huge. But the, one of the things that we enjoyed doing was going in the room where the Christmas tree was and having somebody plug in the Christmas tree lights at night and turn out all the other lights. And we sat there and watched the sparkle in the lights until it was time to go to bed. And we weren't supposed to fight with each other because if we fought with each other, it might be bad the next day. So it was a special memory for us. And that memory brings joy to my heart. When I open God's Word to read the Christmas story, there's no word about a tree. There aren't that many trees outside Bethlehem. There are a lot of rocks. But what you read is the shepherds in their fields. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. I mean terrified. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Now I want us to take some time with just this part of the story. Just a little bit of the story. As I read it, I, I read the words, do not be afraid, and I ask the question, what steals your joy? What steals your joy? You would think that if an angel speaks to you, you would be filled with joy. <laughs> Most of us, most of the time we see angelic encounters in the Bible, people are scared to death. I mean, they're shaking in, in their sandals. In Texas, we said shaking in their boots. But fear steals joy. And that's true in our day-by-day -day living. You know, we fear other people that we determine might not be like us. Other cultures... Uh, maybe other religions, other races. We're afraid. And, and you don't have to look very far in our world today to see that. You see that every time we encounter the news. We fear for our lives. We fear for our children. We fear for our possessions. We fear for our jobs. We fear for our security. We fear violence. We fear loss. Frankly, we fear change. 
all of us fear change. And certainly we're shocked and f afraid of the unexpected. When something totally unexpected jumps on us, it, 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 it gets to us. When you look at the shepherds, they're, they're in the field doing their work as normal for them. If you were to ask them about the Messiah, they might, one of them might quote from Isaiah and say the Messiah would come to preach the good news to the poor and bind up the brokenhearted. He might say the Messiah would proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Might say he would proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our Lord. Hopefully he would say they would comfort all who mourn. But most likely those shepherds didn't know very many scriptures. And they were talking about what men talk about when they get all by themselves. And they've been all by themselves out in the same field time after time after time after time after time. We have a way of, of when we are numb to our surroundings by the familiarity of the surroundings. We have a way of seeing but not seeing and hearing but not hearing. And the moment our comfort zone is disrupted, that very instant we lose our confidence and we don't know what to do or how to do it. For our confidence and well-being can it be erased in a minute. Ten days ago, a friend of mine, two of my friends, uh, a couple from the UK, a minister who's worked with us and his wife, were walking on a beach. And as they strolled down the beach, these two are very athletic. She was a um, um, swimmer on the Scottish uh, Olympic team when she was young. He's always been athletic. As they stroll along the beach, she stumbles on the beach. She'd walked, I don't know how many beaches before and never stumbled, but this time she stumbled. And she broke a hip. And in the hospital, they did x-rays, and then they did tests because they didn't like what the x-rays said. And then they came back and said, 70% of your bones reveal cancer and in an instant the lives of these two people who retired just a year ago has been changed and their their view of the future has been changed and their understanding of what's what's taking place been changed and as she said to me several times on the phone in this last week I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around this I'm trying to get my head around this I'm trying to understand it but some things you can't understand. And in times like that, we need to recognize that God's still there. Fears can erase our understanding of God and our confidence in the presence of God. And we get caught up in our cares. And when we get caught up in our cares, what's wrong frequently takes center stage and God is pushed off to the side. You've read Job. You see Job go through loss after loss after loss. And as he goes through these losses, he, he cries out, Would God that I had never been born. Some of you felt like that. When you read through Exodus and see the Hebrew people escaping out of Egypt. Though they prayed for years to be free from the oppression and bondage of Egypt, when suddenly they're free, they say, I don't like the food in the wilderness. I want to go back to the leeks that we knew before. I don't like being here. I'm uncomfortable here. I want to go back to what I've known. When you read David's life, you see David crying out in the Psalms. And as he cries out in the Psalms, he, he cries out because Absalom 
is seeking to take over the leadership of the land. And, and, and David cries out. Because he wants to change his reality and he doesn't want to face the reality of the moment. How many times have we done that? The joy stealers are not just found wrapped up in a book that was written hundreds of years ago. The joy stealers live in today's world as well. And so we need to ask the question, what ignites your joy? As I explore the scripture, I read the, the message of the angels. I will bring you good news for all the people. Good news. Now, first I have to look at who's delivering that. And you know, the, the, the messengers of God are not always seen as bearers of good news. I've walked in hospital rooms before to encourage, and the mere sight of me scared people to death. Literally. Literally. What they could see was what had been going on in their lives between the last time our paths crossed. And you could see it all over their face as they scooted across the bed. And I remember one man scooting across the bed and, and working on the wall, and, and he had heart problems. That's why he was in the hospital. And, and I said, you know, this may not be the best time for us to talk. I'll see you at another time. Good, good. <laughs> and I, I stepped out. I didn't need to give him another heart attack just being there. But sometimes that kind of thing happens. Now, if we're going to ignite joy, we need to be open to hearing joy. And, and, and we need to be open to, to experiencing joy even in the midst of bad news. Some of us feel like every time we get bad news, God's mad at us. God's angry. But as, as the angels come, they come with a word of good news in the midst of these shepherds' great fear. Of course, the whole message of the, East, uh, of the Christmas story is a message that is filled with good news and fear. Another angel spoke to, in, in the book of Matthew, he speaks to Joseph, and, and Joseph is really, you talk about getting your head around something, Joseph's really having a tough time when Mary tells him the story of the angel and, and her pregnancy, and, and another angel speaks to Joseph and says, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And he hears that, and he sees the angel, and he deals with his fears, but he still has trouble getting his head around it, and yet he doesn't argue, he doesn't fight back. Birth, the birth of a child always gives hope. I've, I've welcomed three children into the world, and I'll tell you what, with every one of them, my hope and my prayer was that they would have a better walk with God than their daddy. That they would do better than their daddy. And their lives would be better than their father's. And I think part of being a parent is wanting something better for our children. And part of the hope that's wrapped up in the birth is wanting better. And part of the hope that's wrapped up in the Christmas story is the desire for that which is better for our world. And God's answer to that desire. The angel proclaims, I bring you good news of great joy. And as he does, he reminds us that we cannot experience the good news if we don't hear the good news. When Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching it to them? Preaching to them that, that God's love is available to each of us if we'll, if we'll turn from our sin and submit to Him. Turn from our shame and submit to Him. Turn from our fear and submit to Him. 
and recognize Jesus Christ alone as Savior. Uh, I, I have told you before of standing in the dirt of a little village outside the capital of Malawi and, and talking to a woman who had one runny nosed child on her stomach and one runny nosed child on her back and one runny nosed child at her leg. And when I told her the story of God's love and asked her if she had a question, she said, will this give me hope? Wow, how do I find hope? The, the message of good news is a message of hope. Of hope. I met with a man in, in this city who was a sharp man. Very successful. Had freedom with his time. Could do what he wanted to. And his question was. What do you have that I don't have? And he wasn't looking for bank account. He wasn't looking for membership in a club. He was looking for something different. Something coming from the good news. I remember a red-headed drummer in Texas, he, he, he sat across the desk from me in, in my office and, and I moved around and sat in a chair next to him and, and he said, is there really, is there really any place in God's heart for somebody who's, who's broken about all the commandments and, and who's done so many ugly things and, and who ruins relationship after relationship? Is there any hope? And Jim prayed to receive Christ that day. And, and that drummer took his drums to church. And he's been praising God ever since. And God's been changing his life ever since. I remember an ex-con named Arthur. Arthur stood about this high. He had shoulders about this wide. And, and, and one Sunday I, I, I baptized him and, and Arthur was standing there in that baptistry and Arthur had a smile literally from ear to ear. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody with that many teeth. And, and, and he grinned from ear to ear. And, and, and when I put him under the water, he was still grinning. And, and, and when I brought him up, his shoulders caught the water. And, and the back row of the choir was, they experienced a Methodist baptism. Because uh, he just kind of washed them. And, and, and what you find in, in, in the journey is, is each of these came from a different place. And, and, and joy comes when we're aware of God's grace and God's favor. And it becomes real to us. Not just a word in a book. Not just a message in a song. Not just a, a, a word from somebody else. But suddenly it becomes reality in our hearts and our lives. What ignites joy? Seeing life touched by God. Experiencing the touch of God. Well, how then can you have this joy? This good news of great joy, as the angel said. Joy grows out of the Greek concept of grace. It's part of this foundation. And, and so when you you look at joy, you're talking about a, a state of mind or a posture of the heart, of the soul. And when you talk of joy, you talk of it as a gift from God, but also a gift to God. For as part of the fruit of the Spirit, we want to walk in the joy of the Lord. Joy is a result of the forgiveness of of sin and our commitment to Christ. One of the, the passages of Scripture that has been told around the world is found in Acts chapter 16 where a, a, a jailer ready to take his own life because he's afraid the earthquake has freed all of his prisoners is told, don't worry, we're still here. And he turns to those who've been singing praise and he asks Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? 
And when he prayed, believing in Jesus Christ as his Savior, the Scripture says he was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Joy comes with that trust. Joy is a result of a personal relationship with Christ. When Paul wrote the Romans, Paul said, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. Let God pour His joy into your heart and your life. Joy is a, a result of the constant awareness of God. David talked of this in the Old Testament. Peter captures his words in the sermon at Pentecost and says, You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with your joy in your presence. David, Peter, both seeking to, to adjust to the joy in their hearts. Joy is a result of Christ's likeness in us. David prayed, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God, I don't want artificial joy. I don't want simply to, to fake it. I want it to be real. Real. It was a little man. Didn't think he could do much, but he carried a little can with a spout on it wherever he went. He had a little oil in it. If he saw or heard the, the door hinges squeak, any of you have door hinges that squeak? I have. I have. If you he heard those hinges squeaking, he put his oil on it. He didn't ask for anybody's help or permission. If he went through a gate and it squeaked, he would put oil on it. And he was constantly filling up his little can, constantly ready to do what his one job was. And he carried it everywhere he went. And that was his task. That was his way. That was what he chose to do. Why? Well, he'd tell you it was to make it easier for those who followed after him. Isn't that all of us, something all of us can do? Maybe we can't carry a can, but maybe we can find ways with the gifts we have to make it easier for those who walk behind us. One of the great joys that happens in my life is, is when I see lives better because we've connected. And somehow God is connected through me. And I think one of the joys you'll have comes when God connects to others through you. And all of us can be conduits for the joy of the Lord with gentleness and thoughtfulness and cheerfulness and encouragement. We can pass it on. As what the psalmist spoke of, the oil of joy can work through us. And Jesus taught that what we say and what we do how we speak and act reveal what's in our hearts. Take a moment and think about that. How have your words revealed the joy of the Lord in your heart? How have your actions revealed that? How's God making His presence known through your spirit and your life? 1967, I was uh, a summer missionary in Hawaii. I know it's a tough place to work, but somebody has to do it. And I was, I was there for 10 weeks, not really sure why. I mean, they had me preaching, and they even had me leading music. That was a disaster. But in vacation Bible school, the children didn't know it. Any, anything was that I, I was, you know, 10 or 12 bars above or below where I was supposed to be singing. Uh, but I knew three or four songs that children knew. And one of them was 
I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. And, and, and we sang that in every one of those vacation Bible schools. And I never was a part of a music ministry that said you got to skip the part that said, if the devil doesn't like it, sit on a tack. He can sit on a tack. You know, I was raised where the devil needed to sit on several tacks because I was spreading them fast as I could. Nevertheless, we sang, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Joy is not written across your face in authenticity if it's not written across your heart in authenticity. And the only person that can put that there is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that happens when we pray and ask Christ to forgive us for our sin and become our Savior. Advent seeks to help us rediscover joy. Joy down in the depths of our hearts. No need for fear to own our souls. We walk with the Lord. And come what may, His joy is our strength. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and the depth of your word which, which explores where we are in life. Thank you for understanding how, how fear seems to own us in time. But we would pray that the fear of the Lord would overwhelm any other fear that comes upon us. Let us trust you and walk with confidence with you because we've committed ourselves to you. We're your children. And anything that comes our way has to go through you. Thank you, Father, for the love that will not let us go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.